Hello everyone, out there in YouTube land, I'm Tom. It's been years since this coronavirus disruption started, and I've been taking this time to eat beef jerky and talk to you on the internet. I'm not an expert or food critic, I just like beef jerky. But this vlog has been good fun, and it's been letting me explore some fun ideas with you, especially regarding game design. So today I'm featuring some quality beef jerky, given to be my, my nephews John and Cullen. This is Ortega Jerky, Christmas Beef Jerky, because it's Christmas. Let's give it a try at Christmas, shall we? Um, uh, it is Christmas, 1225. And um, this happens to be my 70th jerky video episode. Uh, it is Christmas. It's Christmas Day. I could show you what I got for my Christmas present. A t-shirt of Godzilla painting, like Bob Ross. Pretty nice, isn't it? My lovely wife gave that to me. I'm very happy with it. Um, okay, uh, before we get into the actual jerky, I would like to talk about what you know what it is we're going to talk about this week. And this week is not really about game design. It's about jobs and moving up in jobs. Uh, we've all had crap jobs, especially when you're young. You feel like you're kind of trapped in your crap job, and um, and it you know server jobs and low-level manufacturing jobs and uh you know the low-level jobs are often the worst with the most toxic work environment and the worst bosses and um you know they say that no one leaves childhood without without trauma but uh it seems like no one leaves the bottom rungs of the uh, of the job market without trauma either um and that's why I'm showing the picture I am. The, you know, when we're young, we're always trying to move from the left to the right. We always want to go away from the high stress, low pay, toxic environment, uh, always on workplace, to the comfortable, relaxed workplace with very little stress and enjoyable, collaborative place with loads of wonderful peers who support you and uh, inspire you and, um, you know, and give you a work environment that's, that allows you to shine, but is also surprisingly easy compared to the job on the left. And that's, you know, that's, that's a normal thing too. It's a, you know, it's, it's what I've seen. It's what everybody's seen. You can go from a really, really horrible job that makes $10 an hour to an incredibly cushy job where you're practically expected to do next to no work um, that pays you thirty dollars an hour. You know why? What the? What's going on here? What's that, this? There's something weird about this. Um, but I mean, every adult in your life who's already gone through this would tell you the magic secret to get from the left picture to the right picture if they could. Um, but all we can do is share our experiences and try our best, knowing that for every crap job on the left and sweet job on the right, there are lots of really great jobs on the left, which is to say, you know, server jobs or service jobs or low level jobs that are nonetheless for, for purely for reasons of work environment and coworkers, things like that turn out to be great jobs. And there are plenty of jobs on the right that really stink, even though they have bright, airy offices and they're all about, you know, sitting down and doing computer work all day. Um, certainly my, the, the actual job where I made the most paycheck money um, in my career as a video game developer was also the job that was most toxic and that I hated the most and that I couldn't wait to get out of and was awful. And I was so much happier and had so much less stress with a job that the, the job that I took next, even though it was a $15,000 a year pay cut. Uh, you know, so, but this is not me telling you that you, you shouldn't strive for more money because more money is, is stress. In fact, I'm kind of pointing out that w what we all know that, you know, there are tiers of jobs and you you as a young person want to get into the higher tiers of jobs as soon as possible so that you don't have to go back. Um, and 
the only real solution that I personally have is to talk about how I got my first job in the video game industry. So when you do like STEM, like engineering out of school and things like that, it's not it's not real true today as much as it used to be, but it certainly was when I was going to school a very long time ago that, you know, if you had that engineering degree, that 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 electrical engineering degree, that that, you know, physical sciences degree or whatever, then you went to a job fair and you got hired with a company before you even got your diploma. And I can't tell you the number of school chums that I, you know, I helped pack their their bags or their car or their little trailer full of their stuff so they could leave their college dorm room and drive straight to their first place of employment. It was just that, you know, stuff. And that, you know, theoretically, STEM education still theoretically offers that, but it's not really that anymore because there's six rounds of, of interviews at Google and, uh, and Facebook and all that. And it's, it's a, it's a brand new mess, um, for those people, but for everybody else, you know, you, you get kicked out of school and you're like, now what? And the answer for me was starting at the bottom. And it was the answer for many, many of my colleagues as well. What do you mean by starting, starting out at the bottom? Well, when I uh, found a job posting for phone technical support at 360 Pacific, which was my very first video game industry job um, in 1992, uh, was the January 1992 is when I started that job. So I guess I saw the the information about it in late 91. But um, I was hired on to pick up the phone and say, you know, 360 Pacific, how might I help you? And the person would say, well, my computer game doesn't work. What are you going to do for it? And I was like, well, sir, you know, let me tell you, can you, have you typed in this? And what kind of computer do you have? And, well, I'll send you a new disc, sir, and that kind of thing. That's it. That was my first job. And... It was ground floor stuff. You just had to, you know, basically show up and, you know, uh, be minimally employable and uh, and bathe, which was, you know, something that I, <laughs> it's a hard lesson I needed to learn. Um, uh, and, uh, and you got the job, but it was a, you know, it was, it was a sucky job with pushy boss and colleagues that weren't the best and uh, um, lots of customers always yelling at you um, and but it's it's it was my door into the video game industry because the actual programmers for the video games worked just upstairs from me so basically getting into the door in this really ugly yucky job gave me the same door key as all of the people in the fancy places that I wanted to work at and that co-mingling, that connection, then allowed me, in my spare time, to go up to the other floor and meet the people who were the programmers and the people who were doing the job I wanted to do and connect with them. And now it was actually quite easy for me um, as a programmer because it's very easy you know, for any programmer to say, well, here's this little toy programming project that I was working on. And in fact, they're particular programming project that not that it matters was a little robot battle game called sea robots again ancient days no nobody's been but anyways i had done some sea robots in the lunchroom i had heard, overheard some of these programs talking programmers discussing sea robots so when i had the opportunity i went up to my that boss's office mike Steele, and i said Hey, Mike, I heard you guys talking about C-Robots, and I've been doing some C-Robots. Could I show you my C-Robots? And he's like, sure, I've got five minutes, sure. So I showed him my C-Robots, and he had his C-Robots, and his C-Robots crushed my C-Robots in the arena of battle combat. And then he looked at my C-Robots code, and was like, hmm, here's where you could do better. Hmm, this is, oh, you misunderstood that. And, and I was like, oh, thank you, Mike, you're right. That's very interesting. Um, Ten minutes, tops. But it showed that guy, that guy in charge of things, that I was minimally competent at a skill 
that he was interested in. And then what happened within, I think, a month of me going back down, of course, and doing my phone technical support job, uh, was they called me back and they said, how would you like a job as a programmer? And piecing, t piecing it all together later when I was much older and much more wise about the world, uh, what was really happening was is that Mike, that, that team lead, was talking to his bosses. And he was saying, oh, we, 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 we're really behind schedule. We really need more people to work for us. We need more heart. Oh, no. And the bosses were like, we don't have any money. We can't hire anybody. Oh, no. And then Mike was like, well, what about that guy? And boom, I'm on the job as a programmer. And getting your first job is the hardest. Now, I'm pretty certain that this is a better lesson than just for programmers. I think that if you have any sort of skill or valuable contribution, the idea of going to a company, starting at the bottom with the express intention of using that access, using the fact that you have the same key as the people in the fancy suites, to mingle with the people in the fancy suites, to connect with them, to say, okay, well, I'm down here taking out trash and cleaning machines and you know working the assembly line now, but I think I really want to be where you are, and I think I have these skills, and let me show you what I'm doing. Let me show you what I've got, whether it's music or it's programming or it's art or it's writing. You know, do that same thing. Hey, X, where X is somebody where you want to be. Have you got a few minutes to look at what I did? Just this little thing I did to get it into their head. Once you're in the door, once you're in the building, once you're working with them, you know, not working with them, but working in the same place as them. Get into their head that you're you're worth something to them, that you're you could be a contributor to that product or, or, or to that work environment. And then they have that same conversation with their boss. Oh, no, we need more work. We need more help. Oh, well, we don't have any more money in our budget for that project. What do we do? Well, and then you get hired up. Um, obviously, it doesn't work that way in all companies. Obviously, it doesn't work that way in all situations. Obviously, there are some bosses that are going to be jealously protective of their work environment and their people and they don't ever, ever want to hire from within or hire up from the rank and file. Um, but the key to understand is that you don't really know that until you get there. So you've got to roll those dice. You've got to go get the job at the low level. And you've got to already have the plan, the idea that if it's not working out, if it's not structured like you need, if it's not your pathway up, you're going to move on. Uh, and certainly throughout my career, and I've seen nothing that indicates that anything has changed, certainly not in the high tech world. Uh, it's been in my, my experience in my career that lateral movement is how you move up. You don't move up in, in certainly not video games by staying at the same company for 30 years. You know, not that we ever could. The longest I ever stayed at a company was three years. Um, and many video game jobs fell out from under me within one year. Um, so it was kind of, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say it was challenging. I was just saying it's dynamic. Um, so what I'm trying to say simply is, is that, um, whether you like it or not, taking, taking responsibility for the upward path in your career is important and learning to recognize that the companies you work for and the jobs you do are stepping stones for you they're your tools they're not just your tool to get a paycheck they're your tool to go where you want to go and if the tool doesn't work for you if you have a broken wrench you throw it away and you get a new wrench if you have a hammer that's the handles broken you can't use it what do you do you throw it away you get a new handle similarly your job is a tool to get you where you want to be. And if it's not serving you to get you where you want to be, throw it away and get another one. I know it sounds hard. It feels hard, especially when you're young and you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm just one month away from, you know, being thrown out of my year because, you know, 
I'm I'm paying month to month paycheck. I'm doing month to month rent. Um, you know, it's scary. Um, I get it. I was there. Uh, all us old fogies were there. Um, and it really obviously helps to have family members and supportive people that you can lean on. And not everybody has that. And I'm not saying that you have to rely on that. Uh, I also know because I remember when I was a young person, I wanted to do my own thing. I was doing my own thing. I was focusing on my own thing and not constantly reaching back to my family for help or support or, you know, financial aid or whatever. Not that I didn't take that from time to time. Uh, but it was not on my mind to go like, oh, ha ha, I don't care. I'll move back with my family. Ha ha. You know, that's not, nobody really thinks in those ways unless not, not very many. So, and I certainly didn't. But, uh, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is very simply that your job is not just your reason for living, reason for working, reason for making a paycheck. It is also your tool for getting ahead. And if your job is not serving you in your quest to get ahead, to get a better job, to get, get better paid, to get a more enjoyable situation, and most importantly, to do what you really feel you want to do then you got to, in this America, in 2023, about to be 2024, you've, you've got to think laterally. You've got to step away from that job and go get another one. Uh, as, you know, as hard as, short-term hard as it sounds. Um, but that's just me blabbing, you know, as, a, as an old man who thinks he knows it all. So let's talk about something besides, you know, getting jobs in this economy. Let's talk about what you came here to talk about, which is beef jerky. Again, I have Christmas-flavored Ortega's beef jerky, so-called Christmas because it has both green chili and red chili. Um, I've had this Ortega beef jerky from, that was given to me on my nephews, John and Cullen, before. Thank you, John and Cullen. It smells a bit like beef jerky, and it's very it's a very dry, very thin beef jerky. The most... most uh, potato chippy beef jerky I've ever had. And this is clearly no different. You can see how dry and thin this uh, Ortega beef jerky is. But we're going to give it a try. Keep waiting for the heat. I'm not really expecting a lot, but because I haven't got a lot of heat from the previous Ortegas. Um, yeah, yeah, not bad. It, again, like the previous Ortegas I've had, it's very dry. It's not shoe leather, thank goodness, but it's. It's definitely dry, requires a bit of chewing in your mouth. Um, all right, now I'm picking up a little heat, a little way after the fact heat from this uh, thing. So probably you get a more amount of heat the more you eat it. So if you eat a whole bunch at once, then you probably get more spice. Um, but not bad. Not bad. Okay. So let's look at the mailbag. I'm looking at my last YouTube video. Uh, Panky Button says that was a nice hodgepodge of topics. Take care, which kind of feels a bit like to me like a rope a bot um, did that. Uh, so, and uh, Adam Paro of course responds, and because last time I was eating his jerky that he gave me, and it was very nice. Um, he talked about Smash TV back in the day because the last episode was about twin stick shooters and that genre. So, um, thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, that's about all there is to that. Again, this Ortega red and green Christmas beef jerky is a uh, pretty standard Ortega beef jerky. Uh, very dry, very thin, very crispy. And if you like that kind of thing, then Ortega's beef jerky is the way to go. Thanks again to John and Cullen for that. Um, and wow, this is the 70th episode of my beef jerky silliness. So, uh, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of beef jerky in the world. So this is almost certainly not the last episode and I hope I see you for the next one. Thanks again.